can be a more moral practice than passive euthanasia. So it's important that you don't get confused. The question is, in the case of, the, of children with Down syndrome, is allowing them to die ethically more justifiable than actively taking the lives of these children? And it's a trick question. Your immediate gut response is to be like, yes, allowing the children to die is more ethical. Or you might say, no, it's not more ethical. The point is, it's that it's a matter of, it's a matter of the individual patient's perspective. From an analytic standpoint, right? From an analytic standpoint, the question is the following: In the case of, and you should know this from an analytic standpoint, not from a patient-centered standpoint, but just consistency. And it's going to be hard, maybe, for some of you to, to, to see this. In the case of the children with Down syndromes, is allowing them to die ethically more justifiable than actively taking their lives? It's not. That, that's the only conclusion you can come come to. It's a pretty bizarre conclusion to come to, but how, on what merit do you allow a child to die because they have intestinal blockage and Down syndrome, but you would never allow a child who doesn't have intestinal blockage but does have Down syndrome, or a normal child who does have intestinal blockage but doesn't have Down syndrome to die? Clearly you're killing the children because they have Down syndrome and not because they have intestinal blockage. You can't, that can't be justifiable. It's not justifiable. If the decision, however, has been made, and this is the point, if the decision has been made to allow the children to die, Rachel is saying, rather than allowing them to die and nature set in and they wither away and die painfully, actively, and end the child's life. I, I think that is absolutely clear. If there's any confusion or any tension, it's because of probably some moral reprehensibility that the population has because of the learned behavior that killing is so bad. So, the ethical system of justification which legitimizes allowing to die and delegitimizes active killing is unjustifiably based, biased, right? It's unjustly biased. It's unjustly biased. Why? Because there is just a, an assumption that allowing to die is better. When you actually look at the examples, you can't really make moral distinctions, right? Um, when you look at the hypothetical example that he gave between um, Smith and Jones, we recognize that Smith is to be held morally accountable and Jones is to be held morally accountable. If Jones is to be held morally accountable, the, the action is wrong, how can you then say that, oh, but in this case it's okay, and hence the confusion. No, it's, it's wrong here. It's, it, it, it can be wrong. It can be wrong. So if it is the case that in a particular hypothetical, nuanced example, allowing to die can be wrong, then it has to be the case that in a particular nuanced example, actively killing can be right. I'll say that again. If it's the case that in the Smith-Jones example, allowing death can be morally reprehensible, can be immoral, morally wrong, for a specific example, then it has to be the case, and it is the case, that in some other hypothetical example, for example, the example with Down syndrome or the example with throat cancer, that it is morally permissible, it is a moral act, to actively kill the patient. It's context specific. Um, quote, for any purpose of moral uh, assessment, the decision to let a patient die is subject to moral appraisal, right? Whether it's moral or not will be contingent on the circumstance. It may be assessed as wise or unwise, compassionate or sadistic, right or wrong. Here's an example where allowing to die is wrong. We can give an example where allowing to die is right. Here's an example where active killing is wrong. We can give an example where active killing is right. It depends, it's context specific. That's what he, he's just trying to bring, and it's a logical balance, right? He's bringing a logical balance because he sees that um, the analysis is so biased and his argument, which is a profound argument, is, listen, just sort of passionately think about the pain in allowing and sitting there and watching a child die over days. And the agony to the child, and to you, that more so to the child, that it brings. And the, patient, uh, the parents aren't even there to see it. I have a responsibility to do no harm, says Shaw. 
and I want to actively put this kid down so that the pain is over. Similarly, with the throat cancer case, the subtext was that death was the ultimate alleviation of the patient's pain, right? Thus, there is at least, conceptually, some examples in which actively taking the life of the patient is a more just, more ethical means. So, important, Rachel is not concerned with the legal implications of this distinction. He is clear about that. Only the moral, ethical implications. And the last thing for this section, and then we'll conclude, I'll conclude. See my fictional example from a creative piece I wrote in 2005. So I did a creative, nothing, nothing important, not big, don't read the whole thing, just go to the page if you're interested. It's fictional, so it'll give you another sort of take on this. But I've been thinking about this stuff for decades almost. Um, so read pages, click the link and then read pages 123 to 125 and um, I'll give you the general expla explanation of what you'll read. The idea is the main character, um, who's a young girl, she's a, the protagonist is a young girl in, in the fiction, and she's the heroine because the young, I'm not going to get it, the, the protagonist is typically a boy, I decided to make her a girl. She goes out into the world, she's confronted with a decision that she has to make. You make decision A and your decision leads ultimately, I'm cutting through a lot of the fat here, your decision leads ultimately to the death of 10 people. You make decision B, and your decision B ultimately leads to the, the death of um, 150 people. You yourself aren't, and I think the example is much higher than like 150,000, so a really, really low number, a really, really high number. The similarity is that people both die in the example. It's just a quantity that's different. The assumption is that people will make the immediate wrong answer, the utilitarian ethic, and say, oh, well, killing the less is better than killing the more. Ten people die here, a hundred thousand people die here. I'm going to choose A because, you know, ten people die, and that's better than choosing a choosing hundred thousand. What she does, what I did, as having read um, this and complicating the discussion, is she abstains from choice because then she can't be held morally accountable for anything because she didn't make a decision, right? People died on their own, people died on their own, independent to her. It complicates the analysis. It doesn't directly pertain to this analysis, and I'll return to this analysis to make sure that I end on a very clear note, but I think my lecture was, it should have been crystal clear. The idea is, it's not as simple as you think. There are instances where allowing to die is the just act. Perfect example, patient, wants to hold on to the very end, and the patient doesn't want to die. Um, and there is a sense in which the patient's body is failing, and uh, the patient comes to the realization that, listen, I, I can't do it anymore. I thought I, I wanted, I thought I could bear through this, but I can't, I want to go. Um, please just pull, pull the plug. The medical community has an obligation to respect the rights, uh, the request of the patient. The patient has watched my lecture, know what he or she's in for, and there you go. Allowing to die is the option. Um, there is an option where actively killing is better. Obviously in the Down syndrome case, if the decision has been made to kill the child, that's the big if, and my example plays more on that. If the decision has been made to kill the child, then don't delude yourself, says Rachel's, by believing that you aren't, as the medical professional, intentfully killing or participating in the death of the child by withholding treatment because the act of withholding treatment leads to the death of the child so you are directly participating in the death of the child. It's a minor distinction but it just makes you feel psychologically better because you have participated in the act of killing of the child and you did so not because the child had intestinal blockage. You really killed the child because the child or allowed the child to die because the child had Down syndrome. Where that's an option, where that's an option, what you are obligated to do morally is to actively kill a child. Now, granted, the powers that be caught wind of the article as well, and the practice of allowing the child to die was made illegal, which brought balance because now the physician can't make the option, can't make the decision to allow the child to die. It still, unfortunately, hasn't addressed to this day, active euthanasia in the United States is probably one, of, it still is a very, very taboo topic. Um, as we all know, um, Kevorkian did a ton of time in jail for his 
his sort of, you know, he, he I wouldn't say pioneered, but he fought for um, active euthanasia as a means of mitigating patient pain. Uh, and I think it's a, a great contemporary discussion that we should still be having, right? Because the fact that it is illegal to make that decision, um, decision by members of the medical community because of federal and um, um, state and institutional restrictions still doesn't address the validity of the original claim. Right? The fact that the physician can no longer make the option, it's no longer on the table to allow the child to die because of intestinal blockage, still in 2012 doesn't address the point of actively taking the life and the merits and the ethics of actively killing. Um, very, 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 very interesting stuff. It's, it's important that you guys hopefully understand what Rachel is trying to do. He's not demonizing. He's not the bad guy. He's just saying that, listen, the kid's going to die anyway. Rather than letting the kid die through days and hours, um, why not just actively end it and, you know, facilitate a, a graceful exit. So I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. This concludes section 2.0 of my medical ethics lecture series. I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell. Have a good day.